Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 39th Fireside Virtual Talk in the Great Mind series. And tonight uh, we have a very, very special guest, Professor Carol uh, Sikora. And uh, there are some common features about this series organised by the amazing University of Buckingham. Uh, one is that it really is a relax as possible. Um, get your questions in, uh, get them in early if you can. I'll bring them uh, into the conversation um, as often as I can. If you put your name there, that's good. And if the question is quite brief, uh, it means it's easier uh, to get to it. Can you bear in mind, everyone, please, that I'm talking and Carol will be talking to a non-specialist uh, audience. Um, so uh, we're trying to avoid um, uh, too many uh, deep uh, biochemical uh, um, details um, so that it's a talk that everybody can enjoy that's looking at, um, at, at the coronavirus. Uh, surely um, the biggest event uh, to happen uh, in the last 10, um, 20 years, uh, certainly since 9-11, about which we have a talk from somebody who was at the Prime Minister's right hand all day, namely Angie Hunter, um, in 10 days time on that uh, anniversary. But here we are, Carol. Um, and can I also say that to particular welcome to all new uh, listeners, uh, Carol reminds us that he does have quite a number of Twitter followers. Welcome uh, to all of you. And can I say that you're all very welcome uh, to all the remaining uh, 31 talks in the series and uh, listening back to the 38 that have already happened. Enough uh, introduction. I'm not going to tell you who Professor Carol Sikora is because that's going to just use up time. But I am going to ask um, if you don't know who he is, you shouldn't be uh, you won't have wanted to be listening to this talk. Uh, Carol, tell us where you are. That's how we always begin. Is this where you do your thinking uh, and writing? Here I am in the garden of my house in Beaconsfield. I've lived here for 34 years with the same wife. And uh, to start with three children, they've all gone to their own houses now. And it's, it's great. I commute into London most days to Marylebone, which is only 25 minutes away. But the garden is everything. It's just so relaxing sitting here. I and mean, it's a big garden, a bit too much to mow, but who cares? I love it here. It's and peaceful. so just uh, to get more of an understanding about who you are, did you always want to be a doctor? And why did you then specialise um, in oncology? So I, I guess the first notion that I wanted to do medicine came from uh, a book about Louis Pasteur. He wasn't actually a doctor. He was a French scientist that discovered a bacteria caused disease. And it was first with anthrax and then a range of other microbiological diseases, bacteria rather than viruses. And um, he used the microscope to follow disease in man. And it was quite an inspirational book. And then I went back and, you know, I thought, this is what I want to do. I wanted to combine science with medicine. And I've enjoyed both. I, I couldn't do science in a laboratory alone. I just like being with people and doing things. And I've had a, a great career. Why did I go into oncology? Well, I guess my father died when I was 17, just before I went to university. And that was quite a, he had lung cancer. And that was quite moving to see that I'm an only child. So difficult just before you go to college. But that wasn't the only reason. I think cancer is the great mystery. It's the rogue cells. They're our own cells that have gone wrong. It seemed when I started in oncology, which is you know 45 years ago, that if we just got the right combination of drugs, we'd crack it. But it hasn't happened quite like that. We have to be cleverer than that. And we'll get there in the end, but it's going to be more more work is needed. So it's been a really thrilling career for me. And what, what, what is the end, Carol, um, that, that we uh, banish cancer, that we stop it developing or that we pounce on it and deal with it once it has? I think we learn to live with it. We learn to live with cancer as a chronic illness that we control. We may not cure it, 
And, you know, we already do that. We, I've seen patients that I've followed for 30 years with, with metastatic disease. That means the cancer spread. They've definitely had cancer for 30 years. And somehow they've controlled it. And we as doctors have helped them to control it, maybe with hormones in breast or prostate cancer, maybe with gentle chemotherapy and other cancers. And it's a mystery how you can hold cancer in some patients, yet others, young people often come into hospital and they're dead within a month of the cancer that they you've just diagnosed. It's, it's really a complete spectrum of different diseases. So when we talk about breast or lung cancer, it's not a single, it's not two single disease, it's a collection of different pots of disease that behave in totally different ways. And we don't understand that. And 45 years ago, did you expect us to have got uh, further uh, down the path? My own wife, as you know, Carol, you were very kind and helpful to her, died of cancer four years ago. There'll be many, many um, viewers tonight who have um, uh, either cancer themselves or members of the family who have it or have had it. Um, did you expect us to be further by now? I remember the first lunch I had at Bart's, which is St. Bartholomew's Hospital as a, as a registrar in oncology. And I sat down for lunch with the boss, Gordon Hamilton Fairley, my consultant. And I said, what's it, how's it going to end up to him? And he's, he's a great boss to have. You had to work very hard there, yeah. uh, but it was great fun. And he said, you know, I don't know how it's going to end, Carol, but you're, you're luckier than me because you're much younger than me. You're likely to see it being completely controlled. Well, he was before his time, but it wasn't quite right. It, it hasn't been completely controlled and maybe it never will. But I think we, we can learn how to, the molecules behind it, the molecules that go wrong in cancer, we've really begun to understood them. And once we understand them fully, then we can control the whole thing. But we haven't got there quite yet, with a few exceptions. Now, one of uh, aspects of your career that uh, uh, viewers might be less aware of is the seminal role you played in the setting up of the um, wonderful uh, medical school here at Buckingham. Can you say a word about how that came about? Um, uh, the first private or independent medical school in Britain for a hundred and more years? That, that was a real challenge because I was busy at the time and uh, uh, it was nearly 17 years ago, the first conversation. I came up to Buckingham with my dog, not the current dog, an older dog, and we had a look round and uh, we did a walk around the, the footpaths of Buckingham and I thought maybe it can be done. And I thought that the biggest hurdle would be the regulator, the General Medical Council. Luckily, I knew the head of education there. So he took, I phoned him up and said, would this be possible? And he took me for lunch and said, not only is it possible, but we want you to do it. We want to see a change in medical education and only by being independent can you bring about that change. How unusual. No big teaching hospital. Milton Keynes General Hospital. This is ideal place for students. General practice integrated into the teaching program. Students seeing patients in the first week. We did it all and the GMC loved it. It wasn't just me. We had a lot of skilled and lucky help. People came and joined us and we got it going. And it's now we've had two years of graduation. Fantastic. We're up to 130 a year, going to 200 a year. Um, it's going so well. I'm now the old man in the place. I've got the job as chairman of the scientific, the medical advisory committee to the medical school. Uh, and, and Joe Harris, as you know, is the new dean, bright new face and a proper medical educationalist who's what's needed in today's medical education environment. And get in touch with uh, Joe Harris, Latley of Imperial and the team if you want to know more about the medical school. Let's uh, just a quick word there. Um, that noise that went past is in fact um, another of your lifelong obsessions, which are, are railways. Now, what really uh, is is that about? And is it just uh, 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 is it a, a superficial or is it really a deep attraction to the railway? I've got a deep attraction to railways. It's not the train spotter. I remember when I was five um, going up to Scotland to see my aunt. Um, my mother was Scottish and she took me up there on the one of the, the midday Scot it was from Stafford where we lived. And 
changing at crew and I just thought this is fantastic the trains with the corridors the lights the, the whole experience night trains fantastic uh, and so I, I've, I've fallen in love with railways and uh, everywhere I go I have to go to the railway station my wife sadly doesn't share this wonderful experience and so when we go to a strange city and I want to go and have a beer or a coffee in the main central station uh, she looks at me and says okay I'll come along but she doesn't like it too much but I get such a buzz sitting in Paris Gare du Nord or more exotic Mwanza station in Tanzania or even more exotic exotic um, Addis Ababa Central which is a single track going to Djibouti on the coast and the train gets blown up every two or three months so it's not the best and safest journey which takes 36 hours. I've been two hours on the train and then I got off. Okay so we're going to go from something uh, slightly strange um, at railways um, to something uh, enormously strange which is uh, coronavirus. So uh, we want to explore all angles of it, and again, just to encourage um, uh, our viewers, um, we've now got an audience in, in the thousands uh, looking at this. We won't be able to cover all angles. We're trying to look at some lesser known um, aspects of coronavirus, um, uh, more philosophical. Uh, and to begin, um, just tell us uh, what a virus uh, is and and what coronavirus it is. So the great debate about viruses and it's been there since they were discovered are they dead or alive and they have features of both they sort of swing from an inert organism with just a chemical structure a chemistry set if you like but they also borrow lives from someone else they steal the biological machinery in the case of coronavirus of our mucosa in the nose and the back of the throat and use the cells our cells to reproduce themselves they can't reproduce on their own it's fascinating the first nobel prize for virology went to stanley in the states at rockefeller university in 1946 and he got the prize not for medicine he got the prize for for, for, for chemistry and he discovered the structure of a virus that has no impact on man the tobacco mosaic virus a very simple structure viruses are by their nature very simple and just to show the simplicity the coronavirus which is the only virus in town at the moment um, has 31,000 bases on it that's the building blocks of genetic material we have to be careful with the nomenclature because coronavirus is an RNA virus. It's, uh, uh, it's genetic material is single-stranded RNA compared to ours, which is double-stranded DNA. We have, in comparison to the poor little coronavirus's 31,000 bases, we have 6.4 billion base pairs in every single cell and we've got billions of cells in our body imagine all that genetic material and the most important thing is in the last 20 years since the discovery of the polymerase chain reaction we can access the structure of the sequence in nearly every single cell in the body everything we get put a needle into and get a cell out single cell we can get the information and you see the guys in white suits on uh, crime scene investigation films they're just doing the same technique polymerase chain reaction to look for forensic markers blood semen stains and, and that sort of thing uh, for the virologist it's a fantastic tool not just to trace the virus but to actually understand how it's evolved so, uh, Wendell M. Stanley uh, discovered viruses. Um, Darwin didn't know about them. I didn't know about that till earlier today. What would Darwin have said about uh, viruses and where do they fit into evolution? He would have talked about them a lot and they've sort of got forgotten about in the path of evolution. Uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time looking for the missing link, uh, the connection between apes and man and so on, and the evolution of the different, uh, the, uh, the Piltdown Man and all these other anthropological findings of the centuries. But no one has really thought about viruses as evolution in miniature evolution in a very closed environment and I often wonder why in the last six months 
um, why theological people, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he's not a fool clearly, uh, has not written about what's the purpose? Why does the virus exist? No one's talked about that in the literature, even to the point does the virus know between good and bad? Does it have a soul? What happens to eternity for the virus? What's it trying to achieve? No one seemed to address these. I'd like to hear from the philosophers. I'd like to see writings about it in the in the more intellectual magazines that I tend not to read, but I'd read something about that to understand how this virus is going to evolve in the future. So um, tell us about life uh, and where does life uh, begin in plants or cells and how big a, a, um, a wall is that between uh, life and non-life and, and why are you saying that uh, these viruses do not have life? What is it they don't have that life does have? They don't have separate biochemical machinery that allow them to function independently. So if we again take coronavirus, it's a neat example. It's got this 21,000, sorry, 31,000 bases of RNA. And then it's surrounded by a little protein shell with the, you know, the children draw the spikes um, uh, on it, the spike proteins, and then a, a, a capsid protein that's like a capsule around it. And that's it. And that's inert. It can't do anything. It has to get inside a cell, a human cell in our case, so it could be a, a pangolin cell or a, a, a bat cell. Uh, and when it gets inside, it hijacks the cellular machinery exactly like a computer virus. That's why the IT boys call it a virus in a computer, because the virus does indeed do that. It goes straight to our genetic material and essentially injects bits into the right place to produce more proteins that allow it to reproduce itself. The, the disease it produces is not for its own sake. It, it does that accidentally, if you like, because it stimulates our membrane cells to actually cause trouble for us. It doesn't want to do that. There's no need for it to do that. But it doesn't want anything you're saying, Carol. It, it, it is free of, of want and it is free of uh, any desire to hurt or harm. Would a theologian though say that it's evil? Um, is there any good that comes out of viruses or coronavirus in particular? On the whole, no, uh, it's not symbiotic. I mean, there are symbiotic. I was looking at uh, uh, walking a long walk at the weekend and looking at fungi growing on trees. And when you look at that, is there any symbiosis there? Symbiosis implies that both parties gain something from each other living together. And there are algae on, wall, on walls, lichens, for example, that have symbiotic relationships with other plants. So one plant, one uh, the lichen produces certain nutrients and the, the algae produces others and together they balance each other up and thrive by living together as a sort of an agreement, a memorandum of understanding if you like. Coronavirus doesn't have that with us. It just wants to replicate. It doesn't care about us. And that's what we've seen. You know, we can argue about how many deaths there have been in Britain from coronavirus. The official figure is 42,000 roughly uh, over the last six months, mainly in April. Uh, and then a, a tail off after that. Unfortunately, now very few deaths. There's still some. The virus doesn't want to kill. There's no reason it should kill. But you know, a theologian would say, well, it's evil because it has killed some people, but uh, that's not its aim. That's, that's, these people were innocent bystanders, if you like, of its reproductive avarice to try and borrow more and more lives to reproduce itself. It doesn't know why it wants to do this. That's the thing. It hasn't got a brain. It hasn't got anything uh, to, in, 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 in the early 70s, um, uh, the, the polio virus uh, was, was actually synthesized completely in the laboratory and it was allowed to reproduce and it did reproduce. So someone synthesized it as a chemical experiment in, in the States and 
it showed that it would indeed reproduce when put into a living cell. It's, this concept of a borrowed life is a romantic concept, that the virus borrows a life from our cells and moves forward. In the case of corona, it borrows its life from the, 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 the gets in through a receptor at the back of the throat and uh, the receptor called angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2 binds to that, the virus shoots in and it borrows the cell's life and the cells die and as the cells die they release a whole new co cohort of baby viruses um, and then the disease continues and our aerosol that we spread uh, whether we wear a mask or not, we still generate aerosol, will infect other people eventually and cause the relationship between the virus and the host. Both are changing with time. And that's the that's the, the real difficulty now, the sort of conflict. In what should we do to avoid the virus? How strict do we have to be? And will the virus out, outreach us, will outrun us by changing its way of operating? So... Um, if one doesn't believe in in God, um, that's easy. If one does, then um, God cre has created everything. Why might God have created um, coronavirus? I'm waiting for the Archbishop of Canterbury to tell me, and I'd like to hear his thoughts on this if he's listening. Uh, there's no doubt that theological uh, theological people have been very quiet about this over the last few months. They've not issued any statements or edicts, which is unusual. I was brought up, and I suppose I still am technically a Roman Catholic, and the Pope has said nothing about it other than, you know, it's a bad thing for society, which we agree. Uh, I think we've only begun to see the effects on society, um, which we're going to see because of economic ruin, especially in poorer countries. Um, how quickly we recover from this is not up to the virus, it's totally up to us as a society. The effect already has been utterly devastating um, uh, and is set to become even more so. But what I don't understand is what is the intelligence behind the coronavirus that has allowed it to develop and indeed to mutate and perhaps continue to mutate? What is that intelligence, which is so much greater than human intelligence's ability to combat it, boosted by um, international research that we could only have dreamt of uh, 20 years ago with scientists collaborating in real time all around the world and boosted again by artificial intelligence. I, I are are it, we ever going to get ahead of uh, coronavirus and, and we mutations? Have, yeah, we have to, Anthony. And uh, what I find amazing is the tools we're using are the tools we have thousands of years ago. If you look at the great plagues of Roman times, of Greek times, the great plague of Venice and the plagues of the Middle Ages, you know, my old Cambridge College was built because of the plague in, th in 1342. A uh, great plague had hit Cambridge, people died, they came out of the plague after two or three years, the rats died in the streets, the plague came, then they, they all went away. And to celebrate, the city guilds created the, the College of Corpus Christi and the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is my college, out of donations because they were being, it was a thank you present for, to God for getting them out of the plague. And at the same time in Venice, quarantine was invented and we still use it today, as you know, a rather messy uh, arrangement. But in, the, in Venice, the quarantine Quarantine stands for Quaranta Giorni, 40 days in Italian. And the ships were made to anchor outside the, the bay in Venice and would only be allowed in after 40 days. And the sanitary inspector, what a, the pest control officer, would board the ship to make sure no one had got the plague, that there were no rats on board, and then they'd let them off the, into the harbour. And we're doing exactly the same technology. And what amazes me is here we are in this high-tech world. You know, when you look at medicine, I've been around the hospital today day in Aylesbury and been in the emergency room looking around a member of the hospital board and you just look at it and we've got all this technology fantastic scanners we can see insides of people's tummies without them knowing we're doing anything we can do it all but the virus has us beaten and can we get out of this of course we can and it's taking longer and I think the doctors 
don't know how to handle it, obviously. And what, what hope is there for politicians? And we've seen such a mess downstream with the politicians not knowing how to cope with the whole situation. Well, not, not knowing how to cope so much in the West and the politicians doing a, a better job um, in, in the East in particular um, and in some European countries. But what will it take, Carol? Will it take a particularly brilliant uh, insight from somebody to say, ah, that's what uh, uh, is needed to get a virus. Uh, and if that, uh, a vaccine, and if that happens, um, uh, will it sort of already mutated? Um, will there need to be a series uh, of viruses um, as in flu? So I, I think there's two bits of technology. One is drugs that actually affect the course of illness with the virus. And we've had dexamethasone, remdesivir. We've had Mr. Trump with his idea of disinfectants being swallowed and all these sort of almost laughable things. And it's, they're not likely to have a big impact. If you have to go to hospital, you're ill and we've got to avoid people going to hospital, which luckily we are at the moment. People aren't coming into hospital, which is a great sign. The other thing is a vaccination. Will a vaccination work? It's not really working very well for the, the first coronavirus, SARS, which was 2003. No one's got a vaccine for that. We don't have a vaccine for HIV. Both of uh, both viruses and huge programs to get there. And, you know, I think that we don't have a, a, a vaccine for, for MERS, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome. So everybody is invested in the virus and that's quite right. You have to do that. And there are four front runners, as we know, which Oxford, um, is is the one is the British front runner, but there are three others and different types of technology. Um, sure, they, you can mount an immune response that's been demonstrated for all four. But will they really protect against a virus that's pretty clever? It can just mutate. We've seen it mutate already. Um, there's what's called the G mutation. G stands for glycine. The at position six one four of the amino acid that it encodes, a tryptophan has re been replaced by glycine. Quite why we haven't, and this is worldwide, it's just swapped in about March of this year. Just, timing was slightly different in different countries. What's it doing? Does it give it more infectivity? Uh, and does it make it less toxic, less, in, less poisonous to us, less symptomatic to us? We don't know, we don't understand it. And so when you look at the crudity of putting sticks up people's noses to collect samples uh, and then doing very sophisticated polymerase chain reaction, the PCR test, you just wonder how clever this virus is to cause such disruption to us without our being able to understand it. Well, I'm going to pick you up on the word clever. Never in human history has there ever been so much combined raw human intelligence working uh, largely uh, collaboratively to try to combat uh, coronavirus. And yet the intelligence, if that is the right word, or cleverness of the coronavirus is continuing to outwit the best human efforts, including stream mutations. Um, are we ever, Carol Sikora, going to get on top of this? Uh, we will. We definitely will. It's happened to every previous pandemic. They come to an end. So at uh, the moment... They haven't come to an end by human beings getting on no. top. They've come on top uh, because of it's, it's burnt itself out through herd immunity. Exactly. Right it or wrong? It will come to an end. I mean, there's a three, where we've got to today, the, the first day of uh, September and this beautiful autumn evening here, the sun fading over the hill there, uh, is that there are three scenarios and the reality probably lies somewhere in between. Scenario number one, we're going to go into a second wave. There'll be 85,000 deaths. The, ho the health service will be overwhelmed. We'll be back in lockdown, not selectively, total lockdown, just like in, in, in the end of March this year, and it'll be miserable. I don't think that's likely. That is a prediction of the, uh, the worst case scenario from uh, a sub 
group of sage, the, the government committee. The second are little spikes like we saw in Leicester, Oldham, um, Bolton and so on, where you get a spike, but it comes to an end and you go to the local hospital and say, how many admissions have you had? And they said, none, no one's come with any infection to the hospital, no one's getting ill. And you look at the testing, most of the tested patients have got no symptoms at all, not even a fever, not even a sore throat, no shortness of breath. So you wonder what's happening there. The disease has changed, the virus must have changed. And then the third scenario, which I think is the most likely, there'll be little local spikes like Leicester, but not on such a big scale, and it will gradually fizzle out. And we can then ring the bells in the church, if you like, even though the archbishop has been strangely silent and say, fantastic, it's all gone. I, I get a lot of stick for saying it's going to fizzle out. Now you're being irresponsible saying that just because you're positive about it doesn't mean you can wish what's going to happen, but uh, it's going to be somewhere along. It's got to be one of those three or something in between. So I think it'll be, it's definitely showing signs of changing its impact as a disease on humanity. Uh Paul asks, um, which uh, of the vaccines do you think is the most promising? Uh, sadly, not the Oxford one. I'm sorry not to be patriotic, but then, you know, it, well, if it had been a Cambridge one, I think I might have been more supportive. But uh, seriously, it, I think the RNA vaccines are fascinating. So you remember the, the RNA is the genomic material of the virus. And the idea is to take bits of viral genomic material, RNA, that encode for the spike proteins and inject it into muscle, an intramuscular injection. So you just have a swig of RNA, connect to the machinery that allows that swig of RNA to insert itself into the muscle's genome and replicate itself. So it produces proteins artificially in our body. And the reason that's attractive is that the proteins get incorporated into the cell membranes of the muscle and connected to the other array of molecules there, including what are called histocompatibility antigens. And that triggers an immune response exactly as you'd like it, producing antibodies and perhaps even more importantly, T cells, activated T cells. And that's a powerful combination. But the ox all, th all four vaccines, all four leader vaccines look good and but there's billions of dollars at stake. So you're not sure. It's like North Korea having no cases. And you're not sure if that's for real. It's unlikely a country would have no cases of Corona. It's unlikely that all four vaccines are going to have a market. It's just not possible that one won't outshine compared to the other three. The other, Where do the other three go with the billions of dollars invested in them? Nobody knows. Uh, Simon's asking there, um, what's your personal view about how uh, coronavirus came into the world and when? So this is a fascinating story. So uh, there are cases that seem to be documented way before uh, the, the, the declaration of Wuhan to the WHO that they were worried. They called in the WHO and on and around uh, the 28th of January of this year. Um, was it a leak from the lab? Was it an artificially synthesized virus? So it, there was research funded by jointly the National Institutes of Health in Washington, American money to the tune of $3.7 million and the Chinese government who paid the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, to actually do a program. And then all sorts of things happened. And the idea was to see, it's rather like a bank hires young people to come and try and spam its uh, its accounts to try and fish for weaknesses and its it, its uh, protection for its IT system, and so the same concept you take people that do biological protection and see if they can weaponize the virus basically, and it looks as though they did succeed in weaponizing the virus by inserting strange sequences in it. HIV sequences have no business in coronavirus, were found in some of the uh, original Chinese um, sequencing. So it's a, it's a real mystery. Security services of all Western countries have been involved in trying to trace this, and uh, uh, it, it's quite remarkable. Uh, uh, what what actually t transpires, what will happen, I think, will be we'll find cases of COVID way back in November, maybe even October, 
in Europe. So this is a real mystery how this has gone on and where did the virus actually arise? And it may be that there are several coronaviruses that have changed different pathways. And we all we know now there are many different strains of coronavirus that all seem to be very much in common in terms of what they do. So who knows, Anthony, where it came from? Was it deliberate? Probably not. It probably was just a, an error. If it got out of a lab, it just got out. And these things happen. They're, they're people go through the safety precautions are broken all the time. And I, I'm afraid that could have been the case in China. Certainly, um, yeah. Was there a conspiracy with the WHO? Probably not. Uh, I think we're, we're reading, we love conspiracy theories, you know. A A Ali is asking, has Donald Trump helped or hindered the cause of coronavirus? I'm afraid he has hindered it. Uh, his run to with China, his run to with the WHO, not helpful at a time. He, the WHO, and I've worked for it for two years myself, you know, it, it's got faults, but it is the only neutral international health body we've got. We can't create another one overnight. So we've got to use it. We may want to change it. We may want to improve it. We may want to actually give it more power to do things. But to actually go to war with it, as Trump did, for purely, to me, it seems political reasons, to sort of deflect from the blame on what happened in the state. And these ridiculous statements about disinfectant swallowing and so on. I mean, the, the, the man, and his, I, I feel so sorry for Anthony Fauci. He's a decent chap. He's a very well-known uh, immunologist. He's the equivalent of the chief medical officer over there, the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infection, and a very well, well-known infectious disease expert. And, you know, he's the man of reason there. And he gets put down by Trump. And I think this uh, is not help. Um, speaking as a historian, uh, Donald Trump has, does get slightly confused between the First and Second World War, which leads into Sandeep's question, which is about uh, the uh, uh, flu uh, virus. Why did the flu virus kill so many more in Britain uh, than uh the, the, the coronavirus has to date. Was it a much more serious and nasty illness? It was a very nasty illness. We call it the Spanish flu. It wasn't really Spanish at all. It was wartime. It was 1918, it was the end of World War One. And if you remember, uh, you know, these were times when censorship was out there. Neither the Germans nor the Brits nor the French wanted to admit any deaths from flu because it would give away the numbers they had in their forces at different parts of, the, uh, of Europe and the, the various uh, theatres of war going on. So for security reasons, only Spain, who was neutral, uh, and therefore it talked about it, it was people that were 18 or 19 um, a great book by Kathleen Porter, American writer, Pale Horse, Pale Rider. It's a short story book, but that's a very moving story about how it affects two young people who are in love. One lives and one dies. And as she wakes up, that's obviously the lady that lives, uh, she reads that a lover has died in another hospital elsewhere. And these were people that were going to the trenches anyway. So you can imagine the emotion of that. But it was the largest, largest problem of pandemics, largest number of people since the bubonic plague in medieval times. And of and course, the 50 million uh, uh, dead from it worldwide. That has to be a, a very uh, approximate uh, figure. Um, but now, if that uh, was to come uh, presumably because of advances in medical science and in protection, the figure would be much lower. It would be much lower. Also, the second wave was very large, and that's why the second wave theorists, uh, you know, the, the second, second wave scaremongers are out there. And it is scary because the second wave of flu killed more than the, uh, the Spanish flu killed more than the first wave. But was it more uh, deadly to the human being than coronavirus? Much more so, and it led to but a much higher of secondary yeah. pneumonia. And of course, we didn't have antibiotics then. Fleming hadn't existed. Fleming and Chain had, hadn't been at St. Mary's Hospital in London purifying uh, penicillin uh, from the fungus, from the, from the mold, streptomyces. So, uh, you know, as we move forward, uh, we can deal with supporting. What's, what's frightened me a little bit about the last six months is how certain people, 
some of them young, some of them relatively healthy, have succumbed to this virus, and we don't quite understand what's different about them. And the other feature, it's, which is unexplained, and we don't know if it's, it's sort of almost a hysterical reaction of, of us, the doctors, or the children that have got this inflammatory syndrome, uh, which we call Kawasaki disease. Nothing to do with motorbikes, there was a, a Japanese physician that discovered it and wrote about it 50 years ago, which is an inflammatory condition of arteries. And so children often with corona, have, there have been several cases of sadly childhood deaths in London, other countries, other cities in, in Britain uh, from this. It's very small numbers, but it's worrying when you see that and you can't explain it. So explanations make us a bit more happy because even though there may be sad outcomes, we hopefully will learn how to deal with it better the next time. But one difference amongst many coronavirus is not so deadly on those people in their uh, 20s. Both my uh, grandparents uh, on my father's side died from the flu epidemic, both very healthy in their 20s. Mark wants to take it on into picking up what you were saying about uh, biological warfare. Uh, and he says uh, it seems to be doing the job far better than weapons and bombs. Are we going to see now uh, nations uh, dropping um, even more deadly coronaviruses behind enemy lines. Well, what I find amazing... Uh, and what's is, stopping that? What would be stopping yeah, that happening, Carol? Nothing. I mean, chemical biological warfare, we've seen the Russians and the Novichoks and uh, deadly poisons. We've made them important down here. And we're not immune from doing this. We're not as clean as uh, we might think we are. The Americans certainly have. You know, the whole of chemotherapy came from a program of chemical warfare by the Americans and carrying in Bari Harbor in Italy, uh, the John Harvey a, a Liberty ship carrying nitrogen mustard was sunk in the harbour and chemotherapy came about because soldiers and sailors that were poisoned by the gas developed a lowering of their white count so it was used in diseases which caused a high white count such as lymphoma, leukaemia and so on. So uh, we all have programmes and we call it defence, chemical defence establishment rather than chemical warfare establishment but you know, as long as that's there, and we need to know how to defend ourselves. What's the antidote for a, a virus that comes out of a Chinese lab, for example? Um, but uh, your point about chemotherapy, one of many things that I've learned from you tonight, Carol. Uh, James would like to know, is there going to come a time when there'll be more deaths because of lockdown than there would be uh, have been in place without it? I think if we had to go back, let's take the uh, the grim scenario that the epidemiologists love, the gloomy epidemiologists love, 85,000 deaths, complete lockdown by November, shutdown of the NHS to everything that's COVID except COVID. I don't think that's going to happen. And I know the government doesn't really believe that because they've closed down the nightingales, one's been demolished and the others are sort of just wrapped up. Um, there's no doubt that if that happened, then the number of deaths from cancer and heart disease, I, I, you know, I think uh, it, it's quite remarkable, not so much cancer, because that's my specialty, but heart disease, there were 45% less heart attacks, acute heart attacks admitted to hospital for three months from April onwards. And that means people have been sitting at home with chest pain, not dialing 999, not going to the emergency room, just sitting at home with their chest pain. And 70% you know, will recover. The trouble is five years later, that heart that where the, the coronary has uh, been blocked will be weak and they'll go into cardiac failure. So it, it's a problem for the future. We're stacking up. If we had to go into lockdown again, it would be disastrous. Uh, Maine is picking you up there on the Times uh, interview uh, of a couple of weeks ago now in which um, you, you ah. talked about the opportunity cost of um, uh, of uh, all the um, attention being on COVID but not on cancer. Can you put a figure on the uh, excess cancer deaths in 2020? Because yeah, there have been five publications now by reputable groups and they're all doing the same thing. It's a sort of reputable back of the envelope calculation. It's more than a back of an envelope calculation, but we never really, we can't do it except retrospectively. But it's 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 between 30,000 and 50,000 excess deaths by a delay of six months. So now we've 
approaching the six month delay. And we know the total number of cancer patients, rather like the cardiac patients with heart attack, are nowhere near what you'd expect for this period in time. Sherry is bringing us back towards a philosophical point of view. And she says, by the way, that she thinks COVID could be considered kind because it doesn't kill our babies. Uh, but she considers it to be or asks, do you think it could be a warning from nature? Um, and indeed, would would COVID be part of nature? Is it nature's intelligence that is uh, producing COVID? Uh, and is it saying to us that we're being irresponsible with our planet? and nudging us towards um, a, a more sane way of living together. I think, you know, maybe it's a wake up call. I, I think when you look at how we behave, and I'm, I look at myself as well, you know, uh, the keenness for people to jump on planes and go around the world, you know, that's what the virus did. Um, it began in Wuhan, almost certainly, and just went down the airport. It got, took a, a, a Rolls Royce to the, a stretch limo to the airport, and checked into the first class lounge and got a tickets for all over the world with all its brothers and sisters. They just flew away from Wuhan. And if you look at how it spread, it's an airline spread all the time. And uh, it then went to, and it, of course it likes rich people. So first class is its only way to travel. And it likes rich people because on the whole, they are fat, they have a poor diet and they're busy and they drink and they smoke. And uh, that's not, not everybody, of course, but you know, on the whole, and they like old people. Uh, and uh, the cruise ships was just heaven for them. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the princess uh, in, in Yokohama Harbour was a, was a real, you know, it was just bliss. It was like a virus heaven for themselves. And they just went round it and that was it. They danced the night away uh, in, the, in the noses of the elderly there. The average age was 72 and this couldn't be better. So, uh -huh. and there was century as well. So. Uh, Sarah's picking up on something, um, a, a fact she heard this morning, which was that uh, if the figure's right, nine, you're 90 percent uh, more vulnerable if you are obese. Uh, can you just explain uh, uh, what it is um, uh, that, that is particularly attacking uh, these uh, 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 such people and, and what what can be done about it? So the real truth is, I'm afraid we don't know, uh, but it is quite true. Really? If you're really at real risk, I mean, there's several risk factors and I've been through some of them. Obese people tend to be diabetic, so they have a high blood sugar. It often it's not very high, uh, but it runs higher than normal. And that seems to be a risk factor for this virus. So uh, there's no doubt that. Uh, can we target people that are more vulnerable than others? We try to at the beginning. If you remember, people got letters if they were thought to be vulnerable by their GP, telling them to stay shielded. Uh, it sort of partly worked. It was impossible to police. Who would know if you were being shielded? At one point, they were going to shield everybody over 70. So I have to stay at home uh, for, for four months. So I didn't do that. So uh, luckily, and... Um, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the problem is there's no blanket answer. There's no test we can do to check your vulnerability. So if there was a blood test or some sort of saliva test that would tell me that you're more vulnerable than others, then I may advise you shield yourself and the same for me. But there isn't anything. And so the indicators we have, obesity, racial heritage, genetics and so on, are so relatively crude. So we have um, uh, 10 minutes uh, to go. We always finish on time. Um, so get your questions in, please. Uh, I'd very much like to have them. And Ad is asking here. <laughs> Tell the dog to be fired. Alison, quiet on the dog. Thank you. Can dogs get coronavirus? <laughs> and can they, can they give it to human beings? Probably not. I mean, Good. if okay. they could. We'd have seen it with dogs and cats. There's been scare stories in the press, but none have really stood the, the test of time. Now, Ad is asking a question. Can you answer this one, in, uh, Carol, in a non-technical way? Um, is asking about the, the chimp uh, adenovirus uh, and can this same chimp adenovirus vector be used in future vaccines for different viruses uh, or would immune systems recognise and fight it? Just a quick, can can, you can, the can question, you put that in Ad? layman's terms? Yeah, could you just thank repeat that. that? Well, thank you. Yeah. So Ad is asking, 
about the chimp adenovirus right the vaccine he says it looks promising um and he would like to know if that same uh, uh virus um chimp adenovirus vector could be used in future vaccines right so i mean the oxford virus is an adenovirus the uh, one of the americans one is an rna virus and there are two others um including the Chinese virus, which is very simple. It's just you take the ordinary coronavirus and you inactivate it and then inject that in as, a, as, as an antigen to stimulate the response to it. You know, at the end of the day, what's really important with vaccines is safety, much more so than drugs. You know, I use drugs every day, cancer drugs that are totally unsafe, and we accept that. They cause all sorts of side effects, including death and obviously hair loss and sickness and all the rest of it. We do it in the way as best as we can to avoid it for most patients, but they are risky things to take. With a vaccine, you can't, you've got to have no risks. You've got to make it so unrisky that it's safe because you're going to vaccinate populations. 66 million people live in the UK. We're going to have to vaccinate, vaccinate at least 40, uh, 40 million people to get any protection. So of society as a whole, otherwise there's no point doing it. Uh, OK, it may benefit the individual, but it's not going to benefit the, the whole of society. If we want to return to complete normality, we have to find a vaccine that works, that's safe, and that we have a logistics mechanism to, to deliver it to 40 million people. This is a huge challenge and a very costly challenge as well. Could there be worse uh, coronaviruses in future? Um, it's yeah. been roughly 100 years, it has been 100 years since the flu epidemic, the yeah. last really serious uh, epidemic in Britain. Are they going to come with increasing uh, uh, frequency? Alice is asking. That's a really good question. We don't know. I mean, this has really scared everybody. I mean, the, the, the medical professionals, the planning guys, the disaster planning guys. This wasn't a scenario that was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be flu. When I was a medical student, I went down from Cambridge and was at Middlesex Hospital. And I went to central Middlesex as my first medical attachment in the middle of the 1979, sorry, the 19... Uh, 69, the end of 69, there was a, fl a smaller flu pandemic and the whole ward was people on ventilators, very crude ventilators, then mechanical ventilators that made a hissing noise and you could hear the hissing noise. And I had a little bed on the ward and my job was to go and suck out the ventilators, run up and down as a medical student. Tremendous learning experience, check the oxygen levels in the patient, suck them out and so on. And a lot of people died in that. And that was my first week doing clinical. Uh, so we're going to have more and more of disasters coming, but we are going to be much better prepared the next time. Uh, not just us, but the whole of the world will be better prepared. What's great, though, is that poorer countries have had far fewer deaths. Now, it's not that they're not counting the deaths. It's not that. That's a, uh, it's, it's they generally have had far fewer deaths. They've had big numbers of cases, but less deaths. And why that is, we don't know. It's not just obesity either. It's, it's connected to all sorts of things. And we don't understand that. It's as though it's a disease of the rich rather than the poor. Sure, there have been deaths of poor people. I'm not denying that, but they've been much less proportionately. We don't. We will understand when we study retrospectively, when we look back at what's happened. We'll understand a lot more from the in the future. I'm surprised again and again, Carol, by how often you're saying we, by which I take that to mean uh, the world's scientific and medical community, research community do not understand. I mean, it's refreshing to hear that, if slightly alarming also. James is coming in with a question here and says, uh, isn't, isn't it going to be the case that some kind of herd immunity is going to be um, the, the, the only way out of this? I, I think he's right. Um, you know, should we have done it from the start? Should we be more like Sweden? Well, Sweden's strategy wasn't just about herd immunity. It was about, it was good, disciplined social distancing, mask wearing in part, and hand washing, simple tools. Um, 
Uh, and and it's it's sort of if you look at the deaths in Sweden and the number of cases, and now they're they below us. Uh, they're just uh, we're 24 per hundred thousand as of yesterday, uh, and Sweden uh, is 22 per hundred thousand yesterday. So it's it's gone right down, uh, and you know it makes laughable our quarantine arrangements. Why would you want to quarantine people coming from Sweden? They should be quarantining us if anything, because we're going if we go over there, we can, we're a higher country than they are. I mean, it's different for Spain, which is 200 per 100,000 yesterday. So, um, but, but Sweden certainly is an enigma. And again, in, in next year, when we analyze everything, we have all the data, including the cancer patients, the heart disease patients, and we see what's happened to them, we can then compare different strategies. Uh, and, but the Swedes are different. They're disciplined. We're not so disciplined here. Uh, David is saying, three minutes to go. Um, I've been to Leicester recently, Carol, and was amazed by the number not wearing masks or following rules. Should more be done to follow rules, in, in, enforce rules? And Howell is asking, what's your view, Carol, on the effectiveness of wearing masks? <laughs> you know, today in the hospital, I was very politely told off by the infection control nurse. She came and showed me her badge and said, your nose is showing and I had to put my mask across my nose. So wearing a mask unless you wear it properly is useless. So that's the first thing. When I when this whole thing started, I didn't really believe that could be effective. But what's happened over the last six months, more and more data come has come from what are called meta-analyses, when you take all the literature base and you synthesize it into one big diagram to see. There is some slight benefit in protecting other people if you wear a mask and you have an unknown infection. Obviously, if you know you've got corona, if you have symptoms, you shouldn't be going out to any public place where there are other people. But if you don't, and that's the problem with this, there's a phase where you have no symptoms, you're well and no temperature, and yet you're actually infecting other people. Wearing a mask has a small benefit. And it, it's the same for any aerosol generation. It has a small benefit. So I've given up. I Socially, I feel I'm a sociopath. I don't like wearing masks. I don't want to do it. I want to rebel. But I know it's better to do it. And it's a small price to pay if that's what we have to do to get out of this before Christmas, for example. Let's do everything we can. Schools went back. Question. Quick final question from, from Graham asking about T cells. That's, sorry, Carol, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, oh. should, should we be doing more about T cells um, and are they more important than antibodies? I think they are. Uh, uh, antibody testing picks up less than 10 percent of us have got antibodies. They're transient and they're variable. So some people are strongly positive, some are weakly positive. It doesn't seem to matter. That means you've been infected um, and unlikely to get it again. T cells is probably a more profound immune system that response. And then natural killer cells is a third avenue that has been published on, but not really. These are difficult to measure. To measure T cells, you have to have fresh blood. You have to take it down directly to the lab. You have, it's fiddly to do this, the measurements, whereas antibodies you can just do with a $5 test kit on, on yourself if you can prick your finger and get some blood and put it in the right place on the on the kit. So these are, you know, it, it's like the man looking for his car keys and he loses them on one side of the road but looks for them under the other. And when asked why, because the light, the lamp is over here, I can see them. It's what? exactly the same thing. We don't know what the relevant roles of these different fu functions of the immune system are. Wonderful analogy. Um, and Amanda says, uh, Lawrence, um, just a massive thank you, uh, Professor Carroll, for, and for all your tweets during lockdown. Uh, Cherry says, brilliant talk. This should have been on the BBC, the ITV, the whole lot simultaneously. <laughs> for the terrified population. Uh, you've certainly made your, your dog go uh, barking. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think anybody else will feel remotely barking after uh, your talk tonight, Carol. Can I just encourage all of you to keep uh, listening uh, to the uh, series? Uh, you're very, very welcome. Pass on the details to family and, and friends, uh, and uh, but above all, uh, with uh, seven o'clock just coming up now, Professor Carol Sikora, um, a great uh, ally and friend of the University of Buckingham, 
uh, great voice of independent thinking, truly what free speech is about, independent thought, clarity of thought uh, and, and compassion and uh, and great roundedness to you exemplify in your life. We can even forgive you uh, your love of trains. Um, uh, uh, Carol, thank you uh, for a brilliant talk and thank you everybody for, for listening in. It's been great to have you.